Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, if you would stand with me for our opening song, it's going to be 214. It's one you're familiar with. Um, he has made me glad.
about that song. It actually, um, some of it was penned as a song. Um, and then at the time that it was written, there always had to be three stanzas. They didn't, couldn't just be two. So um, he came upon a poem, and that's where um, the third verse was penned. But then he went and changed a little bit in the other stanzas. Um, so actually, if you look this up, because I was looking to cut and paste to avoid um, typos and errors, um, whenever you look it up, I got the poem. So I'm practicing it, going through it, and I had the poem typed in the PowerPoint. So I had to go back and change it to the song because it's similar but yet different. So anyway, um, I didn't realize that's why some songs are stronger than others, or longer than others, because at certain times um, when they were penned, you had to have a certain number of stanzas. So um, our next song is Nothing But the Blood, 337 if you're in the hymnal. watching the little thing fly away. Uh, I'm easily entertained. Uh, praise reports, uh, anything good happening? The nothing good. Warmer. The weather's warmer. The weather's warmer, yes. yeah. Yes. yeah. I just pray the weather is better and I can get around without a cane or a walker, so all is good. Yes, yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, Prayer request as well. Remember the ladies' retreat this weekend. Um, keep our speaker in prayer and all the ladies that are <coughs> attending. Um, that it's a good time. And also, if you would keep um, the IUP employment situation in your prayers, uh, they announced. Thursday that they're eliminating 39 secretarial positions. Um, another 40 of them are being cut to half time. 
Um, Karen Mack and myself were both affected by this change. Um, nobody's going to be in the same job that they were in before. Um, just pray for us. Um, we'll be getting a phone call this week that we are offered the position that they're putting us in and you immediately have to give them a decision. Wow. So pray that we make the right decision. Yes, yes, yes. Pray for IEP and the situations there. Um, cuts are always hard. Um, and those in the coal industry and oil industry as well as they've had some rough spots and any others? I guess I have a phrase. I retired from IUP in July, so. <laughs> yeah, you and Jim jump ship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They saw the rats coming. Yeah. The, yeah, Butch? Darlene's not doing well with her back. And the, her sister that has cancer. Mm -hmm. We took her granddaughter in. Now she's got a tumor in her lung. Oh, she's okay. only like 17, 18. Okay, so member Darlene, they're back at her her granddaughter who has a tumor in the bone as well. Your sister's granddaughter. Sister's granddaughter, yeah, sister's granddaughter. <coughs> uh, just remember that. Remember uh, Dan's cousin, uh, let's see, is his wife that has cancer? Yeah, he has, he has COVID and she has cancer like in the fourth stage. Uh, so please pray for that family. Um, they got it all hit at once. Any others? Laura Lee is online and she's asked us to remember a friend of theirs, Andy, who's in AGH with serious heart issues. Okay. Um, doctors are trying to figure out what's going on and how to help him, but keep him in your prayers. Okay, there's friends friend with heart issues. Uh, any others? I go for surgery on Tuesday. Okay, remember Chris, to go to surgery on Tuesday. You can pray for Karen as she's recovering from surgery uh, that she had last week. Give the update on Crystal. Yeah, the, the girl we asked you to pray for who was in hospice, um, she, she's doing better in that she decided she didn't want to be in the hospice in there anymore, so she got well enough to go out, and she, I think she has hospice at home now, um, but she said they was drugging her up too much, and, and um, she couldn't do anything. Uh, but they, because she's in the hospital, they couldn't test her to see if she's better or not. As I said, her organs were shutting down and she had two or three days to a couple weeks to live. Um, so just keep praying for her. I don't, we don't know exactly what's going on, but she is doing better. She walked out of the hospice with the help of a walker or a cane or something. Yeah, they saw that um, so continue to pray for her. It's, she did go home, but it's not necessarily mean that she everything's good. I, we don't know yet, um, but she is better than what she was. Um, anything else? Pray for we had three deaths within 24 hours. And I wish you remember the families. The Lippert family lost her father suddenly, um, unexpectedly. Um, Kiever lost a mother, and Tripoli family lost a son who was only 50, suddenly unexpected. Okay, and there were these three families that lost loved ones uh, very quickly. Anna goes Wednesday. Yeah, our friend Anna from Kentucky that visited us up here. It's having her first baby and it's not turned like it's supposed to, um, so they're going to do a C-section on Wednesday. So remember her in prayer. She, she had peace for this. This is really scary for her. Yes? You pray for me and my back. Okay. It's totally ego for arthritis. It's been in my last Okay, so remember Butch his back with the arthritis. He has lots of pain in with that, so let's pray for that. Any other unspoken requests you have? Okay, let's have us do a prayer for us. If you'd stand with me, um, I'd be glorified. Be glorified.
Gracious Father, we come before you lifting our request to you because you hear and answer prayer, that you listen, that you listen to the cry of your people. Father, hear all the many requests that were voiced, Lord. We pray for those who have lost loved ones who need your comfort. Wrap your arms of love around them and comfort them. Comfort the grieving ones, Lord. You said you're near to the brokenhearted. Bring your nearness, Lord, this morning. We pray for those whose jobs are in jeopardy. We pray for IUP and all the cuts being taken place. We pray for Karen and, and Connie, Lord. Give them wisdom completely on what to do and what choice to make. Only you know the future. We don't know, and we ask you to give them that wisdom. We pray for those who are sick, Lord, who need your special grace. For this cousin who has stage four cancer, Lord, we know that you can touch them, you can heal them. Yes. Help this one who has COVID, Lord, as well, that you would bring your healing. May it be mild. May it not bring the, the worst of it, we pray. Lord, so many requests that need your touch. Help Butch, Lord, his back, Father. Touch the arthritis. Break it up, we pray this morning. Let the fire of your spirit come and burn up all that's there that's not of you. It's not what you put there, Lord. You're able to do all things. Nothing is too hard for you. Lord, for each request, Lord, hear them this morning. Please hear us. Help Anna, Lord, as she goes in for C-section, Lord. If you don't choose to turn the baby, Lord, we ask you to turn it if possible. Lord, you know best. You see things we don't see. We pray that you would touch each one. Touch Ashley, Lord, as she needs your healing touch on her body as well. That you would touch the lung, Lord, and bring healing to it. We pray that you would, each request given in the Sunday school hour, that you would hear those, Lord, and meet those needs. Father, we thank you that we're not just a big conglomeration, that you see us just a group, but you see us individually. You know us by name. The very hairs on our head are counted, Lord. You know us completely. And Father, for each request, each unspoken request, Lord, each one is crying out of their heart to you today. Hear them, we pray. We lift them before you. We thank you that you listen. We thank you that you care enough to listen and to come to our aid, to give us what we need. For that, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
something he said um, when in fact John the Baptist said I baptize you with water like this for repentance he said but after me comes one who's more powerful than I whose shoes or whose sandals I can't even carry and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit he said and fire and so fire was to be the symbol of the baptism of the Holy Spirit uh, and water was the symbol of the baptism uh, with water for repentance. And he said, one is for repentance. In other words, when we ask Jesus to come into our heart and forgive our sins, we're baptized, and the water symbolizes washing away of our outward sins and things that we've done. But then he said, there's another baptism, not just with water, where we dunk them under the water or we sprinkle them. Uh, that's a baptism with water. He said, there's a second one that's for inner cleansing, because... Jesus comes in to live with us, but there's still part of us that wants to do wrong. There's still part of us that wants to uh, do the bad things. And so our nature gives us the wrong disposition, the wrong desires. And when we get saved, when we get baptized with water, we make Jesus our Savior. When we get baptized with the Holy Spirit, we make him our Lord. He becomes the master. He becomes the control of our lives. And uh, so when they receive the Holy Spirit... Uh, when they were saved, when you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and the water symbolizes the Spirit coming in us. But then he says, Jesus is going to baptize a second time. But this time it's going to be with fire, and the Holy Spirit being a symbol of fire, not just with water. So it was something different. It was something deeper than what the other were. Many were baptized with water. Most people who have been born again have been baptized with water to show that their sins have been washed away. But he said, everybody also needs the second baptism, which is not with water again this time, but fire, which fire which cleanses. It, it purifies. It takes away our wrong desires inside of us. And it's like uh, if you want to rob a bank, you don't want to. <laughs> but if you did, uh, and 
You wanted to know what the safe combination was. You wanted to know where the security cameras were. You wanted to know how much money was in the bank. How would you know that? Well, what would help you to rob a bank? Scoping the scene. Scoping the scene. What, what other thing would you, would you do that you couldn't see by just walking around outside? You need somebody inside. You need somebody that works in the bank. Somebody that knows all that stuff. And so when we have become born again, the Holy Spirit lives in us, but our sinful nature still does too. And it's like an insider. So when the devil tempts us from the outside, our sinful nature says, yeah, yeah, go for that. Do the bad thing. Don't do what you're supposed to do. Disobey your parents. Lie to your parents. And so that's what's in there. That's what he wants us to get burned up by the Holy Spirit coming, the, the disposition, the bent towards doing the wrong thing so that our lives will be straightened again to do the right thing. And so he says, be baptized with water for the repentance of sins. But then he said, Jesus is coming to baptize not with water again, but with fire. And so remember those two baptisms, one with water, one with fire. One cleanses deeper than the other. The one is just for the outside. So let us pray, and uh, then you can get your candy from Becky. You stole the candy from me. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless each one of these young people, Lord, to be baptized with water, Lord, to symbolize that they've let you into their heart and forgave their sins. But, Lord, help them to know the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well that will cleanse them deep within and, and change their disposition, change their, their uh, bent towards doing what is wrong. Give them a straightness in their life that comes by your Holy Spirit, with your fire coming to cleanse us. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Go ahead and get your candy. I think it'll burn. I know it'll burn. I think it'll burn. Go ahead and try that. <laughs> nice job. But he's got candy over here. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I can throw each in. Yeah, you can. Have your Bibles turn to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. <laughs> fishing for walleye all day, not getting much as a bite, the fisherman gave up. On the way home, he passed a fish market. He asked the owner to throw him six of the biggest fish that he had. Throw them? Why? He said, because I'm going to catch them. I may be a lousy fisherman, but I'm not a liar. So I want to go tell people that I caught the fish. And so you throw them to me, and I'll catch them. Uh, in Acts chapter 1, we begin uh, the, the talk about the Holy Spirit, and it's, it says in most Bibles, the Acts of the Apostles, but really, it's the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles. It's not really, they're not the heroes, the Spirit is, and uh, so we want to look here in Acts chapter 1, and we'll begin to look at what the Spirit is, spoke about in the book of Acts, because uh, we think about it's easy to think about the Father, God who sits in heaven on his throne. It's easy for us to think about Jesus because he came to earth and we got record of all that he did and we have all these pictures that picture Jesus doing things and so it's easy to talk about those two. But it's nearly just all crickets when we talk about the Holy Spirit because he can't be seen. He's invisible. He's not like the Father in heaven in, in that way. He's not like Jesus who we have pictures of that may or may not be correct, but at least we have something. Uh, but the Holy Spirit is kind of the, the one that we don't talk about much. In fact, Stephen Elliott said we are basically not Trinitarian. We don't believe in the Trinity as much practically as we are a and We just believe in the Father and the Son. 
But there's also the Holy Spirit. In fact, the only one on earth today of the Godhead is the Holy Spirit. Uh, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. The Father is in heaven, listening to our prayers, ruling the world. But it's the Holy Spirit alone who is here on this earth to help us. And so in Acts chapter 1, it says this. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait or tarry for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. And again, he, he re, re-says, retells what John had said. He said, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates my father has set by his own authority. But... But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in, in Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After this, after he said this, he was taken up before them, before their very eyes, and a cloud hid them from their sight. They were looking up intently into the sky and he, as he was going up, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who has been taken from you, will be from into heaven, will come back in the same way that you have seen him go into heaven. Heavenly Father, help us to understand that which is somewhat difficult. Let your spirit speak to us today and understand your word. Make it alive to us. Only you can do that. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said, we often minimize what the Spirit has done in our lives, or we minimize it because it's hard to, hard to understand. Um, Robert Morris uh, wrote the book, The God I Never Knew, and he talks about the Holy Spirit. He uh, says, how friendship with the Holy Spirit can change your life. Billy Graham wrote the book called The Holy Spirit, How to Activate the Spirit's power in your life or God's power. Francis Chan, when uh, Bob uh, Budabal was teaching in Sunday school down there when he first came, used the series from Francis Chan called The Forgotten God. The Forgotten God. And he talked about the Holy Spirit. Um, but here we see that God, the Holy Spirit, can, can speak through you just as he did for David. I got it off on. God, the Holy Spirit, can speak through you. Now, we didn't read this part, but if you go over a little farther in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, he talks about the Holy Spirit speaking in the Old Testament. Not just the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. And he said there in verse 16, Brothers, he said, the scriptures had to be fulfilled concerning Judas, who guided those who arrested Jesus. This was predicted long ago by the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through King David. Now, we are not uh, going to speak for God in the same inspired way that David did, who was part of uh, Holy Scripture, but God still wants to speak through us today. He still wants to use His Spirit to help us speak to other people. The Holy Spirit was involved in the Old Testament, but he's become the main focus of the New Testament when Jesus left. Jesus said when he was leaving, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the comforter of you, and it's better that I go away so that the Holy Spirit may come. It's not less than, but it's better, he said. 
And in the Old Testament, we see what the Spirit did. It says in different times, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon for, for one, and he blew the trumpet, and he called all the men together uh, to go to war. The Holy Spirit came upon him. And it's Samson that we think about. And if you see pictures of Samson in, in, in art, he's always this huge, big, muscled guy, and, and he's so powerfully looking, but that's not reality. Because though he had great strength, it wasn't in himself. It wasn't in his ability. It would always say, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson, and he did this. It was the power of God. It wasn't just himself. And the Spirit would come upon Samson with power. And says, and Samson tore that lion apart like one who tears a young goat apart. He had nothing in his hand, no weapon. He just grabbed this lion, and he ripped it apart. Because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. In the Old Testament, it was often temporary. The Spirit of the Lord would come upon them for something, and then that would be it. He, he would be gone. He would come upon them for this. And for Samson, it was every time seemingly that he had supernatural strength, it was because the Spirit of God came upon him. There were other times he didn't live like he ought to. <coughs> but still, it was the Spirit of God who gave him strength to battle like he did. It says the Spirit of the Lord came upon, powerfully upon him, and the ropes around him he was tied up with became like charred flax, and he just broke them. In the Old Testament, Saul, the first king of Israel, it says Samuel predicted him. He said, the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. And in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 10, it says, And the Spirit of the Lord did rush upon him, and he prophesied with them. And so he was involved in that as well as Jeremiah. God says, and you hear in the prophets a lot of times, they'll say, And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, The Spirit of the Lord spoke to him, saying, In, in 2 Samuel, David says, The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me, and his word was on my tongue. Does God still speak? Is his spirit still here? I'm afraid sometimes we just don't listen very well. But God the Holy Spirit wants to speak through you. There's been times in my life when I've been so encouraged because of someone who obeyed the Lord, whom God spoke to, and they came and answered questions that I was going on, questions I was asking God that nobody else knew about. And somebody called me on the phone and said, Hey, I got an answer for you. God said to call you and tell you this. And answer the question that they didn't know I was asking. I had a pastor's wife, and at the end of a service that had never met me before, walked in that one Sunday morning, and what I was asking God about, she answered at the back door as she was sharing with me. And she didn't say, thus says the Lord, but she said exactly what I needed to hear. God wants to speak through us in the same way. God can and will. I remember in a prayer service, we were praying somewhere around December. And I don't remember what, what the reason was. We were just, we had music playing. We were walking around the sanctuary praying. And um, a lady in our church, her dad was dying in the hospital. He was in the hospital. No, he was in, he was in hospice. And um, he wasn't saved. He had he'd been raised in church, but he'd been out of church for many years. And he was dying, but he didn't know Jesus. And I felt like God said to me, go tell her, let her know that her dad will be saved. And so I did. I spoke to her. I said, I think God's saying that your dad's going to be saved. And she said, another pastor several years ago had said the same thing. And her dad was saved. A preacher went in to witness to him, and he had already given his heart to the Lord before the preacher got there. And so God answers prayer. But God speaks through us. God, the Holy Spirit, can speak to us and through us. A friend of mine met a district superintendent who he had never met before, and uh, he was down in Mississippi, and he said, uh, what do you want to know? He said, you want my resume? You want my thing? He said, no, God already told me to hire you, put you in this church. He said, I don't need your resume. I don't need anything else about you. God's already told me. And he didn't even know him. Because God, the Holy Spirit, wants to speak through us like he did David. Secondly, God, the Spirit, spoke through Jesus. And this is, this is strange. You think Jesus, being the Son of God, would just speak through himself. He wouldn't need to be 
have anybody else, but it said in that verse I just read to you, in verse 2, it said that Jesus spoke to his disciples through the Holy Spirit. And think, why did he make that connection? Why did he do that? Uh, until the day he was taken up, he said he gave instructions through the Holy Spirit to his apostles, whom he had chosen. The Spirit was, because we don't think about the Spirit even working really so much until Jesus left. But he was working there as well. Jesus said on one point, he said, the Holy Spirit that I'm talking about, he's with you now, but he will be in you. He will be in you. Right now he's with you through me, but he will be in you. And he spoke about another time. But the Spirit was there and the Spirit was active. And so because the Spirit uh, speaks through Jesus, that's why he said things that he said that seemed to be outrageous. Jesus never even started his ministry until the Spirit filled him. And again, the Son of God, what, what's the reason for that? He gave us an example to follow. He was 30 years old, had never done a single miracle, never done anything else until he was baptized by John. And it said the Spirit of God descended on him like a dove. And it was from that point on he began to do his ministry and his miraculous uh, involvement in, in his ministry God had called him to do. But it wasn't until then. After the resurrection, says he spoke by the Spirit. And so this is why he could say to his disciples these outrageous claims. In Matthew 10, he says to his disciples, go preach the gospel of the kingdom. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, drive out demons. Freely as you receive, freely give. You mean Jesus was letting these fishermen do these things? Yes. He even said in Luke 10, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and overcome all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means will harm you. And then in John 14, 12, he says, Verily I say unto you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Jesus said we could do what he did and even greater things because he's going to the Father. When he goes to the Father, he's sending the Holy Spirit. And so he said that's going to be better. The Spirit spoke through Jesus. But the good news is he's promised a gift for us. Number three, it says God promised us a gift. And when you, want, when you have a gift, so it says, I'm going to give you a gift. What do you say? What do you think? Oh, I can't wait. I just can't wait to get that gift. Especially as a little kid. You've been promised a gift, and, and I just can't wait. I can't wait for Christmas. I can't wait. I can't wait to get this gift. I can't wait for this. I really want it. But God has offered a gift that many people don't seem to care that much about. Jesus said at one point, if the Father knows, if a human father knows how to give good gifts to hurt his children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? But many are scared. In fact, Robert Morris was told, he said, when he went to Bible college, watch out for those people that talk about the Holy Spirit. But Jesus says here in, in verse 4 of this chapter, he tells his disciples, once he was eating with them, he commanded them, do not leave Jerusalem, tarry in Jerusalem until the Father sends the gift that he's promised, as I've told you before. John baptized with water, but in a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said, I've got a gift. The Father has promised a gift. And I'll tell you what it is. It's the Holy Spirit. But wait until you begin ministry until after the Spirit comes. Don't be satisfied until you get it. The Father has promised us a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, we don't earn it. We can't be good enough, holy enough. But God has more for us. That we want to look at the fourth thing. God has more. He says, but when they asked him about this question, they said, all right, it's time. You're, 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 going to, you're going to bring the kingdom to Israel. You're going to set Israel as a great nation again. You're going to throw out the Romans. He said, no, the times and dates for the kingdom coming really aren't any of your business. It's on a need-to-know basis, and you don't need to know. And right now, I don't even know. And when he get back to heaven, I'm sure he did. But at this point, he didn't know either. But he said, but 
You will receive power after the Holy Ghost comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. And so he says, God has more for us. Why would he need power to witness? What, why? Just witness. Well, for me, it was I didn't have the courage. I, I lived as a Christian throughout high school. I tried to obey God the best that I knew how, but I never once tried to get any of my friends to become Christians. I never really pursued them. I never talked to them about Jesus. Why? Probably because I was afraid. Didn't have the courage. But after in college and after being filled with the Spirit, he gave me the power to go back to Chuck and to Pat, the two guys I hung around with. And Jim Storch went with me and we talked to them about Jesus. For the first time, I was able to share with them not only that I was a Christian, but I was trying to get them to become Christians as well. But it took the Holy Spirit because I didn't have the courage. Peter didn't have the courage. When the, the little girl said, you're one of Jesus' disciples. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I've never seen him. I don't know him. But after the Spirit came, Peter stands up and preaches and says to those people, you have killed the Son of God. We need power to witness because we need courage, we need conviction. The Holy Spirit brings conviction to the people that we're speaking to. If he doesn't, we can't do anything. But also he confirms by signs and wonders. He shows the power of God by signs and wonders. In a uh, Stephen Elliott, the uh, district superintendent over all of Canada, said that in one of their church services, they, they were uh, praying for, for something, and one woman said that she... And this may sound strange to some of you, but they felt like that God wanted to heal somebody with pain in their jaw because they had pain in their jaw. Sometimes God the Holy Spirit will show us what's going to happen or what he wants to do through pain in a part of our body that we don't have pain in because there's nothing wrong there. But so she did. She said, is there anybody here that has pain in your jaw? And this woman said, I started in your Alpha program. And she said, I had TMJ. The doctor had diagnosed it. He said that uh, I needed to take these pills and I needed to go see a physiologist and get treatment. She said, but something inside said, just wait. And in the middle of this alpha meeting, when this lady said, I think God wants to touch somebody with jaw problems, she said, that's probably me because that's what I have. And so they prayed for her and she said, the pain went away. She said, I went home and I chewed some gum just to see if I could make it happen again. If it hurt, it didn't hurt. Went back to the doctor, and the doctor was amazed at, at what had happened because there was no pain. The TMJ was all gone. In fact, she asked, what's this alpha program? What is this? She began to tell her about it. And people that have experienced an encounter with God, where God confirms his word in some way, are more likely to receive Christ. And that's what she did. So he gives us power to witness. He gives us more because we have to have it. We need power to, for service, to overcome the resistance that's going to come. There's going to be people that aren't going to like it. There's going to be discouragement that comes, and we need the power of the Spirit not to be discouraged because there are times we want to quit. But we need power to live holy in a wicked world. You can't overcome temptation if you don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. I, I remember those days, it, you're just on a treadmill of sin and repent, sin and repent, sin and repent, sin and repent, and you can't seem to get off the treadmill, it just keeps continuing. Until the Holy Spirit comes and drives out the inside help that Satan has to give us an answer. We need power to suffer for him. You know, we, when becoming a Christian, it may involve suffering. It may involve persecution. And we don't have the power, if we only come to Christ for him to make our life better and, and pain-free and rosy and everything good, then we don't really need the power. But if we want to live for Jesus and it's going to be difficult, and we're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit for him speaking. He wants to speak to us, but he also wants to speak through us. The missing ingredient in the modern church is the Holy Spirit. Most of what we do, we could do if God came or God didn't come. But what can we not do unless he comes? What's the missing ingredient? You, you ladies have 
Well, if you, maybe I shouldn't say this. There's probably been times you've made something you left an ingredient out of. Like yeast, or something and it won't rise and you can't figure out why, or you forgot to put the sugar in and it doesn't come out quite right. When there's a missing ingredient, it's not right. The missing ingredient in the modern church is the spirit being involved. But God can speak. Stephen Elliott talked about being in a family camp in Michigan. And uh, his friend Ian Dunn was there. He was preaching that night. And uh, on the way to the building, uh, Ian said, I think God has a word that he's given me tonight. And he said, okay, what is it? He said, I, I don't know. He said, there's, there's a woman here named, I think it was her name, Sue. Um, and she knows somebody named Jack. And she's going to be a world changer. I said, okay. So he preached the message that night, and when he got finished, he asked Ian to come up. He shared the word with the people. He said, I think there's somebody here tonight named Sue who knows someone named Jack, and she's going to be a world changer. So he waited for somebody to respond. Nobody did. He said, I really think God said this, but I could be wrong. So nothing but crickets. They just waited. They closed the service. Dr. Elliott said he was standing there with Ian when the service old people were filing out and this lady walks up and she said, I think you were talking about me. She said, my name's Sue, my grandfather's name's Jack. And he told me this week that God's going to make me a world changer. No way she could, he could possibly have known this person, never seen her before. But all of a sudden God had spoke. And you're going to find in the book of Acts that God the Holy Spirit speaks through his people. He is the missing ingredient. The book of Acts is to be our textbook for the church. And we need to see what God can do that we can't do on our own. The missing ingredient we need is God's Holy Spirit to speak to us and through us. Let's all stand.